Hello and welcome. I'm Joy Williamson Lott, Dean of the University of Washington Graduate School, home of the Office of Public Lectures. I want to thank you for joining us for tonight's Graduate School Public Lecture with Seattle King County Director of Public Health, Patty Hayes, who will discuss the COVID pandemic and impacts of systemic racism. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the School of Nursing, the Population Health Initiative, our talented live stream production team, and graduate school staff who all helped to make this live stream possible. Thank you. I also want to thank you for your continued loyalty as viewers of these great live streams. We know it's not the same experience as what our in-person lectures offered. One day we will be able to see each other in person again, and I know our team in the Office of Public Lectures is really looking forward to seeing you too. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speaker. Patty Hayes, Director of Public Health, Seattle and King County, has over 30 years of experience in public health, policy development, and advocacy. Most recently, Patty has been responsible for the COVID response for King County. In addition, County Executive Dow Constantine and Patty declared racism as a public health crisis. Patty is co-leading the efforts in the county to address systemic and institutionally racist governmental policies and procedures, and to build pathways for community-led solutions. Patty has received numerous honors and recognition, including the University of Washington Alumnus Summa Laude Dignitus Award in 2020. Patty has a bachelor's and master's degree in nursing from the University of Washington School of Nursing and was inducted into the Washington Nursing Hall of Fame in 2002. Thank you for joining us tonight and enjoy the lecture. Good evening, everyone. I'm so privileged to be here tonight and to have this discussion with you. I want to thank the University of Washington graduate programs and thank the Alumni Association. It's a real privilege to be here. And as I begin, uh, I would like to do two reflections with you. First, I would like to ask you to join me in reflection and acknowledgement that we are on the traditional land of the Coast Salish. For me, I am on the land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. I honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish people who are here continually to bring light to their wisdom and ancient heritage. And in addition, I want to acknowledge that in King County, we have lost 1,300 lives to this pandemic and to the pain of their families, neighbors, and our community. The coronavirus pandemic is the biggest public health crisis in a century. It's been devastating to our global community and in the United States has shown a spotlight on how racism impacts the health and well being of Black indigenous and people of color across our county and indeed our country. That's what I wanna to talk to you about tonight. And as we go through, you have the opportunity to post questions and you can go to mayiask at uw.edu and put your questions in and we'll have time at the end for those. So I look forward to presenting to you our journey here in King County and then responding to your questions. Public health's mission is to improve the health of all members of our community. And I have a slide that shows our mission here for you. And we know that within that, institutional ra racism has meant that the BIPOC communities are significantly disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, despite uh, efforts by the healthcare system and public health. Impacts of the pandemic on our BIPOC community will have long lasting impacts if we don't make systemic changes now. What I'm gonna cover in our time together is to go over 
the pandemic in general. I'm gonna look at the upstream impacts on mental health, housing, food access. I'm gonna talk about our COVID specific approaches. I'm gonna talk about undoing racist structures, reinvesting dollars from the criminal justice and legal system to the community through the lens of how we talk our, and walk our talk and listening to the community. It's one year ago today, uh, this week, that I was standing with partners who were already experiencing discrimination and the impact of the COVID virus coming into our county. Here you see an event that was held February 7th, 2020. When the first case came into King County and was up in Everett, we started seeing the racist actions towards our API community and particularly a couple of instances down in our international district where the community requested that we come together and show a unified statement that the virus doesn't discriminate. So it was my privilege to have a listening session with the community and then hold a press conference standing together to say that, that this has no space as we're addressing a pandemic. The next slide shows our indicators, which are very important to track the pandemic. And you'll see that it talks about the general cases. It talks about how we're doing uh, with very specific strategies. Are they increasing or decreasing? These are indicators that were established in the very beginning with the work from the governor in setting up the phases and also very important to public health so that we can show the public, are things getting better? Are they getting worse? And in that it links to our plan and our actions. The next slide shows further of these indicators. And you'll see that right now we are in a spot where in King County, we're actually overall doing really knock on wood better than so many places in the country. And just last month, I was notified that of the top 50 largest counties in the country, King County, when you look at the case rate, the only bigger, the only large county that was better than us was Honolulu, Hawaii. And we know that Honolulu actually, Hawaii shut down uh, their, whole, their whole state. So it made me very proud for what was going on in King County. But these indicators only tell part of the story. What's behind these numbers? We have to get from this balcony view down to more deep impacts. So as we looked at the impacts on key economic and social Im impacts to King County, you begin to see when we look at these metrics that we have been experiencing huge impacts. These impacts, which you know, are the unintended consequences of the pandemic to social, economic, and health impacts are just deep and extremely disturbing. When you take a look at the food insecurity, when you take a look at the increase in family violence, these are serious concerns that will last far beyond the pandemic as we try and recover, as our economy is so impacted. And when we go beyond this and look specifically at racial disparities, you'll see in the next slide that it is very clear 
that the pandemic has made the health inequities and structural racism more apparent. We have a dashboard that shows this and that we update on a regular basis. Tracking this is extremely important because we need to watch and deploy our resources in public health to where we see the highest level of disparities. So as you see in this, it's a very high disproportionate impact on communities of color in King County with the highest rates among the native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Latinx and black communities. By geography, we see higher case rates in South Seattle, South King County. Areas that are less wealthy and more diverse are more impacted. And the biggest toll is in areas that are already disadvantaged due to a long history of structural racism. And while cases are found throughout the county, there are higher rates in that South King County and that's, there's small concentrations in North King County, a pocket in Northeast King County, and then in South Seattle. The locations of higher rates of cases generally overlap with where there are larger concentrations of communities of color. And although there's more to learn about this impact on the Black, Indigenous, Native populations and communities of color, there's a lot we already know from data on health conditions and our communities experiencing that provide explanations and shouldn't surprise anything. We've been watching the disparities in communities of color for years. They experience more underlying health conditions. We know people with underlying health conditions, including heart disease, diabetes, lung disease, and obesity are at higher risk for COVID. And we know in the neighborhoods, many black, native, and indigenous people, there are less resources that can contribute to more positive health outcomes. There's less access to healthy, affordable foods. There's less walkable neighborhoods. That it is set up to disadvantage these communities. This leads to a higher prevalence of chronic health conditions such as cardiovascular disease, So that all leads to increased risk in COVID-19. And in addition, when you take a look at living and working conditions, more communities of color live in multi-generational households, which can make it difficult to physically distance if a person's positive for COVID-19. It has to call for different strategies to help people be successful in isolation and quarantine. And in addition, the lack of a social safety net the high cost of housing and the minimal opportunities to save mean that many people are living paycheck to paycheck, so are unable to take, take time off from work. When our contact tracers talk to people who've been exposed and they are worried because they are fearful for losing their jobs, they can't afford to not work, that is a different situation that calls up to different actions. On top of that, then we have our community members who are undocumented and are not able to access programs or are fearful of what the retribution would be for even applying for a federal fund, funded program. So all of these things are behind this data. They're the stories we must listen to and they call us to be bold in actions and to question and look and talk at every moment to see how we're doing and how we can improve. Now let's look at the percent COVID cases by race and ethnicity over time. This clearly shows you that we have a disproportionate problem. A recent report described the data from a statewide survey of almost 6,000 respondents over the age of 18 who would likely not be eligible for existing publicly funded healthcare coverage options due to immigration status. 
as well as several community listening sessions. What did that data show us? 95% of the respondents cannot work from home, many due to holding essential jobs. 76% say lack of health insurance was the main reason they did not seek care for a serious medical issue. 42% cannot safely self-isolate at home if they receive a positive COVID test. 57% of the employed respondents say they risk losing their jobs if they miss work due to an illness or needing to care for a sick family member. 85% live paycheck to paycheck. 66 reported difficulty paying medical bills in the last two years. So you see COVID just shone a light on that racism is a public health crisis. These situations were not created by COVID. These were long-standing problems. These were long-standing problems that cried to be addressed. And now with COVID shining the light, public health needed to address these issues from the health and safety so that people could survive and develop new strategies and ways of helping the community survive the pandemic. Systemic racism impacts the health of our communities. Our racist systems and structures have created this environment that I've just described. And we can see from the maps, we know that that south end of King County is a high percentage of essential workers. They're at higher risk for the illness. They're already disproportionately vulnerable because of racism in the healthcare system. Living in crowded conditions, sometimes poor housing, unable to access services due to language limitations, and having historic distrust of government systems because of prior abuse and racism. And this is important to emphasize. Historic systems within government have created distrust. And we must look as government at how our own actions of the past have brought us to this place and develop strategies for community voice, for community-driven solutions, and to make sure that folks in the situation that I just described can find a way to make it through this pandemic. Let's consider the COVID response overview. This slide shows you from a public health perspective that a combined approach is needed to bend the curve. No single strategy will be successful on its own. And none of these strategies will be successful without also addressing racism. So first, going clockwise, community mitigation. This has to do with social distancing, being able to stay home, limiting gatherings, wearing masks, washing hands. The things that we know reduce the spread of the virus by reducing the overall number of available hosts that the virus can spread through. Large scale, large scale public information campaigns are essential and they motivate people, but we needed to look at what else we needed to do. The next one is surveillance. Testing enables us to identify positive cases and case trends in the broader community and outbreaks in congregate settings. But if people don't trust the government and don't feel safe to go get tested because if their test is positive, they may lose their job, different strategies again have to be taken. Containment, that's essential to know who is positive, make sure they isolate, trace their contacts and have them quarantine and test. Contact tracing contains the ability 
of the virus to find a new, ha new host so it ensure that we can hit a dead end there. But for communities that are unable to isolate or they are afraid to quarantine or they cannot because of their living situations, again, new methods. So this is the example of how for each one of these, we have to look at what we need to do. So let's consider the response here. We developed with our community mitigation strategy, a pandemic and equity community advisory committee that is made, made up a majority of community-based organizations and communities, representatives from communities of color. We hired navigators from the community so that we would have someone going and being our liaison to help us know what we need to do, who we need to talk to, what we need to do in the right way for the messaging, and also to tell us uh, when we're off base and, and to redeploy. Our contact tracers that we've hired into our work, are 50, over 50% 50 of them have been bilingual, which has been very important. And for the rest, we use a language line. We also translate into 32 languages. All these things are just basic, but we've also partnered with the eth ethnic media so that trusted sources from the community are actually carrying the message or asking us the hard questions. All of these were new strategies developed within the pandemic. And those places outside of King County that have not sat down and listened to community and begun this journey, I believe are having harder outcomes and they're lost in their strategies. Whereas I know that we can improve every day by sitting with and listening to community. So on June 11th, Executive Dow Constantine and I declared that racism is a public health crisis. And we did that very intentionally when there was a moment and a readiness for action because it was really important to me that these were not just words, that they were words to action, that there was a way forward to both shine the light on the old ways and what we were trying to move towards and do. And so the first step was to make this declaration. And then as you'll see in the next two slides, we're working to change the narrative here and the actions. This first slide shows the healthy stream of inequities. You can see that the systemically and organizational racist policies and structures that we have in place lead to conditions like food insecurity, like a disproportionality in the justice system like limited and unsafe parks. I've been amazed to see maps before the COVID outbreak happened that actually showed that in the neighborhoods where we have the most need for parks is often the place where we don't have them. And so it leads to the outcomes you'll see on the far right, health problems. We have mental illness problems low birth weight babies, all the things we see. So how do we change that to the healthy stream? Here's the hard work that government and the community and all of us together, there is a personal journey for each one of us. There is a organizational journey and there is a cultural journey here too. But as we start to develop pro equity policies, and ask the hard questions, have the community guide us, and a commitment to racial justice and define what that means, we create a new stream of conditions. 
so that we turn the tide and our country owns our past. We have to own our past. We have to own our present when we make decisions that are maintained within a structurally racist government or a structurally racist healthcare system. You have to own those in order to change it. But as you see on the far right, the outcomes that we're seeking are the best for all. They create good health. They create the ability to be happy, healthy, safe, and thriving. So as I look at where we went, Executive Constantine had the opportunity, and you'll see a quote here from the Black Lives Matter Seattle King County Board of Directors that really set, as they said, the tone. Executive Constantine made the commitment to implementing a racially just response to this crisis. And the first place he could go was into the budget process. And this was amazing because at the time we made this declaration, the normal government process into making a budget was far, far, far along. And what the executive did was to basically turn it on its head and in six weeks, take the input that the community had been giving over actually a long period of time to resurface that, to talk to organizations. Again, they've given their input and oftentimes government does not respond back to say what they did with it. So we had the opportunity to pull input together and so to lead with racial justice priorities, to work on the representation at all levels of decision-making, these purposeful steps to begin to end racial bias and its negative effects. This is a journey, it's not a one and done. I can't say that enough. In every one of these steps, you have to realize that as an organization, as an individual, as a white woman, I have to look back and evaluate myself every day. How am I showing up? How am I listening? How am I putting forth what I believe is my responsibility in this space to stand by my community? So the 2021 budget, proposed budget that the executive uh, set forward and that the council approved include new investment in transformation as a beginning step in the criminal legal system, as well as funding priorities for more pro-equity work and develop in partnership with advocates and community members that will continue as we implement. These investments start to shift the historic and current power structures that represent a down payment. It's only a down payment towards a long-term and what I foresee can be a permanent shift in county policies and operations that we need to do to ensure our black indigenous and our members of people of color can thrive in King County. In addition to those budget act actions, the executive also committed to advancing policies and practices that will move the county along. One of the highlights of this has been how we have shifted even our contracting process. This was something that public health could step into because of the best starts for kids levy, which is a levy to begin to invest in our youngest and in our families so that children can thrive. And through that, we realized we needed to reinvent the contracting process because our community-based organizations in our communities of color were not being successful in applying for dollars from the county. So we have spent before the pandemic, some years in retooling this in a different way to offer technical assistance, to offer information, to allow these small community-based organizations so that we could get rid of unnecessary barriers to allowing them to fully participate. This is a long journey. It's not a one and done. 
So our cross-sector approach to racism really in the next slide shows that we're addressing the criminal legal system, economic development, housing and human services, health and wellness, the infrastructure through what I call a public health approach. And what that means is we use the data, we use the stories from people, we use the power of convening, of being with community, to have public health assure a lifting of voices and a response of government. So through government policy, budget, and practice, we need to be held accountable by publicly reporting our process. And that's part of the public health approach. And I know that right now we're all in our county developing our dashboards, our scorecards, so that we are showing to the community and public health really wants to lead the way. Our dashboards have been a highlight that I talk about wherever I go because those dashboards are meant to be used by the community. They have been a shift in our epidemiology over about five years under public health to look at what the community says they need and how do we show our data in a way that the community can look at it. And we're calling on the state to additionally address a more disaggregation of data because we often don't get data that actually pulls apart the fine tune we need to allow a community to see its own self. When you look at the API community or black, that is a broad category that is a disservice to the community because that community knows they can't be compiled in that way. And we are a partner in calling for change in that. So all of this is our journey together. And the next step in all of this and in the pandemic is that we know vaccines change the, tra the trajectory of the pandemic. We're all seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but we must stand in a place and understand the anxiety, the level of misinformation, the fear, the distrust that many of our community is holding at the same time they're hearing that vaccines change the trajectory of the pandemic. How do we as a community to come together and to respect that space of our community members who are afraid, who hear that this vaccine may have been done too fast, that it may be not what they're hearing, or that they're told something that is not based in science. I have been so pleased to partner with members of the media and with our community. I try and show up in as many spaces as Dr. Duchin does to talk about these vaccines as to how a leading scientist is a woman of color. We are grateful to the community the leaders in the community who are using their voices to tell what the truth and the science is, to help us in breaking down the misinformation. So the vaccine and the change in the trajectory will only be effective if we keep our eye on addressing equity at every turn. And so what we are doing in our vaccine approach is to continue the work to address racism through every action we're trying to make. For example, we have stood up our mass vaccination sites in South King County. And we have within the phase where we know the older adults and the folks who are in the category 1A, which is our first responders and our healthcare workers and folks in the long-term care system, are the priorities. But within that, we've worked with over 20 community-based organizations to make sure that the folks of the BIPOC community can get access to those appointments. And I'm proud to say in just our first week, we've had 50% of our appointments 
of the BIPOC community. There's still work to do. I've looked at that data and it is imperfect. And we know that we need to work with the community more on the strategies. And I also know that we are listening uh, and that we have heard the mass vaccination sites don't always work for our communities. And so we're looking at more partnerships, more mobile strategy, more pop-up strategies. But in all this, I want to say that I'm hopeful that if we all hold our place, do our part in this journey, use our voice, our position to move forward, we can continue to break down these structures and to create a healthcare system that is equitable, that we look at our outcomes and we stand with outcomes that are not what they should be. We own those outcomes and we change our way of doing business so that people can be healthy. And I challenge all of you to join me in that commitment because this work must continue. One of the things I wanna end with that I am so very proud of is that the University of Washington School of Nursing, as I've talked to the Dean and the faculty, they have taken this to heart. They looked at their budget. They wanted to set up an anti-racist budget and they turned around and worked with their own in, in the School of Nursing and they have set up a center for anti-racism in nursing. I believe this will be a shining star in the country. And I am proud to stand with the University of Washington School of Nursing in this effort. And I hope all of you will look into this work. The leadership and the commitment to the working community so that the pipeline of nurses changes, so that the education of nurses changes. And I, as I've talked to the Dean about, that they educate disruptors so that those nurses that go out into the healthcare community are disrupting the system that we have in the healthcare system and those racist organizational policies that are often blind to the structure. They need to have the light shown on them to move forward. So I invite all of you to join me in this journey. It's a personal journey. It's a cultural journey and it must be an institution and structural journey. And it takes all of us in this space to address racism and create the country that we all hope we have. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to uh, invite you all again, if you have questions, to you can go into may I ask at uw.edu and post your questions. And I am going to open up the questions here so we can start that part of tonight. So the first question is, you know, we know racism is a public health crisis and that King County has worked on an anti-racist budget, but what does an anti-racist budget look like? This is a great question. And I want to say, this is a question you each need in the organization you're in to ask this question. What does an anti-racist budget look like where you stand? I've told you the example from the University of Washington. For King County, it was a matter of a start in the budget process that took funds and invested them in community action that is making structural changes and things like the sheriff. And you will see uh, the scorecards that the county executive is developing, and you will see on our website and our dashboards, our efforts to make very visible the work we're doing and the outcomes that we're seeing so that we can work with community to improve those outcomes. So the next question is, how do you develop an equitable approach to delivering COVID vaccine to those most in need? And this is an ongoing effort that we're making every day. What we're doing is we're looking at the maps I showed you and we are designing our strategy live time. I've often said that the pandemic 
is a perfect example of science lifetime. You are watching science evolve right now. And what we learn, we must change and put into action. So what we have done, I've mentioned how we're act, acting in our uh, mass vaccination campaign, but I'll tell you last, uh, last week, I sat with our faith-based organization conference and I heard very clearly from our leaders that they believe that we should have a strategy that partners more with them, that we have our faith-based community sponsoring some of these pop-ups and being active and uh, vibrant and carrying the message. I love that. And I can't wait till we have more doses in order to act that way. So the next question is one I love. What is next for public health nurses? What does the future look like? Well, I think the future of nursing has never been brighter. Uh, I know that the applications to schools of nursing all across the country have been exploding. And I think it's because people have seen the commitment and the heart of nurses uh, all across the country. And for nurses in public health, their uh, commitment uh, behind the scenes, they're often not the folks you see on the media, but my nurses are out in the homeless encampments. They're out in our uh, different vaccination efforts. They are watching our epidemiology and creating our work with employers every single day uh, it's amazing and inspiring and keeps me inspired every single day. The next question is, what would more mobile uh, vaccination sites and pop-ups look like? And how many would you need to reach an entire community in collaboration with other mass sites? So this is where it really uh, is a shift in government. In the past, Government would be asked to make a plan and implement it. What I've been saying to our elected leaders is this is a whole community effort and we are developing it live time and listening to the community. So as I said with our faith-based leaders, they just said last week, we need to look at this strategy. So as I'm looking at our maps and our gap areas, I'm thinking, okay, when we get more doses of vaccine from the federal government, how do we place those pop-ups in that area? Our team is actually looking at it live time. So instead of having a static plan that you've seen government do in the past, we are creating it live time with the community. And I gotta say that's so different, that's very stressful for people <laughs> because they expect to see some uh, hard plan that they can, <laughs> Uh, criticize or try and change, whereas what we're doing is organically making it with the community. And the outcomes I'm seeing at first, uh, we have up to 40% of the 75 plus folks vaccinated around the county already. That feels like a partial win to me. I know that there are some of our communities of cover color that we have not reached yet, but boy, it's exciting to watch those numbers go up. But I think it's partially because we really are organically doing this. So there's a question on how much it costs. You know, right now we are so fortunate in King County that we have elected leaders that are telling me, find a way to make this happen. We have philanthropy that's stepping up. I've got the business community offering their space and offering their assets to us so that I don't have to have a hard cost and to look and limit things based on cost. I can mix and match and use public health to be oh, like an orchestra leader who's putting all this together so that it's, it's owned and developed by the community. It's gonna be very important because the next question is about uh, essential workers. This strategy is very important to prepare for that. When we open up, when we have enough doses, because doses are the limiting factor right now, when we have enough doses, we are going to see that you have pharmacies in every neighborhood, hopefully, that has vaccine. We have pop-ups that are in uh, and uh, with your community-based organizations and with some of the faith-based community. We're gonna have some large mass vaccination sites for the folks that that works for. We're gonna have mobile teams that are going out to the homeless and encampments so that we don't forget that, that population and those folks. 
So it's this multi-layered of strategies that's going to work here to get to everybody. Because by the summer, that's what the federal government is saying, that we will have vaccines available for everybody. We have to have this whole structure available. And indeed, you know, this is about employers as well. Employers are thinking about how do they make vaccines available if they're a large employer. And that conversation and that readiness is what the next month or two is all about. So the next question is, can you describe how your community health workers know who to outreach and the screening assessments they use? Well, you know, uh, when you hire from the community, they know who to outreach. So unlike some uh, places that hire community health workers, but they're actually just a title, when we hire community health workers, we're hiring them from the community. And so what we're committed to doing is actually having our liaisons, having our community health workers be from the community, because gosh knows we need them to tell us <laughs> who it is that we need to be talking to, who do we need to be listening to. It's time for government to go and sit at the community table. It's time for government to stop creating its own tables and expect people to come to it. So we're literally paying people and we are committed to making sure that we have people who are from the community. I had a very inspiring story last week from a community member from a very marginalized community, a community that has been treated horribly over hundreds of years by the government. She was telling this story in almost tears because she has been the liaison to that community. And she wanted to report back that she got 30 of her community leaders appointments for vaccine. And it just brought her to tears because she knew that those community leaders were going to go back and be the people that talk to the community. That's what we need. That's working with community and lifting community. So it takes, keep thinking about things in a wholly different way. You have to be able to sit in what I call adaptive change. Adaptive change doesn't have an easy answer. You have to be willing to sit there and to say, how can we do it better? Are we, are we getting the outcomes we want? How do we commit to those outcomes? You have to be ready to have community look you in the face and say, you're screwing up because we are. And you just have to be willing as government to sit in that place, to model it. I know that people see me every day and that I model behavior. So I think about that. That's important in my journey. And I challenge everybody who's listening to think about that as well. We all must sit in that place. We all must recognize our history. We all must claim where we sit in organizations and be ready to move forward and that nothing is perfection right now. So there's time for a few more questions. Again, you can put it into may I ask at UWEDU. Are there any more questions? Or have I got you all so thinking so deeply? Here's a question. Can you provide an example of how UW can collaborate and actually let our communities lead efforts? Oh, there's, there's, uh, there's more than one. I, I think that uh, just like I had that slide that shown that, that we're just, COVID is putting a light on things. I think that the UW uh, new uh, center that the nursing school is setting up is really uh, working to figure this out, to talk with community. I know Dr. Butch DeCastro is actually sitting in spaces with community, doing listening sessions being with community and then building this off of that community input. 
I think that the UAW and uh, just with Husky Athletics, we've had wonderful conversations with them on how those leaders are presenting themselves. How are they modeling the way? How are we honoring where they came from and what they're doing? I was given an example of uh, one of uh, the uh, UW Athletics where they had a COVID outbreak and it was in, in women's athletics. And those women were so horrified that they had this problem and they were so committed. They practice every day with their masks on. They don't take them off. They know that they have to do this if they want to compete. So they're modeling what we need to do. We need to shine a light on those examples. One of the questions are, how are you helping older people who live independently and are not computer savvy to sign up? Boy, is that a nightmare right now. I got to tell you, the, the expectation both at the federal level all the way down has been such a problem in this, in this uh, arena. So what we've done, because I mean, I have enough trouble with my technology. I mean, seriously, I don't know how people do it. So we have actually gone to the community-based organizations that work with older adults. And we are looking to set up uh, really some hand-holding for this, not expecting people to know how to use their technologies, but really trying to make sure that we have those folks that are the trusted messengers right there know who are those people who are isolated at home and help them get appointments. Now, one of the biggest problems is we don't have enough vaccine for people. And so the frustration is huge out there. And I just have to beg forgiveness that we don't have enough vaccine and, and just keep going because it's gonna get better. It's gonna get better, but it's not gonna get better for another month or so. We have to all hang in there. Last question, are there any specific rec uh, any specific anti-racist practices, trainings, or strategies you would recommend? You know, I think there's a, a lot that's emerging. I don't have anything specific, but I think as you watch the School of Nursing and other leaders in this space, you're going to see uh, more and more uh, trainings. But I have to caution, you know, it's not a matter of training. It really is a path. We're all uh, walking a path and you have to look at the path you're walking. Do you need training? Do you need a mentor? Do you need to be in an affinity group? What do you, what do you need for your own path? Don't rely on training. It's good for what it is and you need to move forward on your own path because you will model for your organization. So it's been such a pleasure here to be with all of you. Uh, I really uh, am so grateful. I hope that this has given you some things to think about and uh, places in your own career, in your own path that you can move and uh, use some tools, use data, but listen to stories. I love to sit and listen to the stories and reflect them as best I can. I don't own those stories. I try and be the conduit for the stories from community and to honor the community as I tell those stories. I think stories are some of the most powerful things that we can do. And then as we have data to match that, we move forward and we evaluate our practices and we change our practices. And with that commitment, we will address racism. Thank you.